think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Kerry Gross as our grand round speaker today. Dr. Gross is visiting us from Yale, where he's a professor of medicine and epidemiology and currently the director of the National Clinical Scholars Program. And Dr. Gross has been at Yale for the past nearly 20 years. Prior to that, he completed some of his training in New York. He went to medical school at NYU, followed by residency at Cornell and a chief residency at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and thereafter a Robert Johnson Clinical Scholars Program Fellowship. Um, Dr. Gross is the director of the Cancer Outcomes Public Policy and Effectiveness Research, or Copper Center at Yale, and the overarching theme of his work is the disconnect between the evidence generated from clinical research and the actual needs of older persons with cancer. He and his colleagues have used state-of-the-art techniques, including social network analysis and hierarchical modeling to yield new insights about the complex interplay between health policy, clinical decision-making, and patient-centered outcomes. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gross. Thank you for the invitation, and it's really wonderful to see so many uh, friends and colleagues here. I didn't kind of forgot I knew so many people at, at Sinai. I uh, uh, have a couple of disclosures. Let's see. Yeah, I just used it a minute ago. Welcome to Simon. No, it's the same. Uh, we get so let's try and do an off on. This okay. No, on the side. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A reboot. That's Did fine. you have to click it? Sorry. It was just so, working. Yeah, we clicked it twice. All right, fine. We can just do this. There we go. Okay. So, uh, we have actually made uh, substantial progress against cancer over the past 20 years. Uh, this data uh, looks pretty impressive. Um, I'm struck by the year 1999. Uh, my wife and I were married in 1999. A couple months later, her sister uh, was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. So we brought her to Sloan Kettering. I had my chief residence in a couple years before. I knew some of the clinicians there. And Lisa um, had her surgery for her, for her glioblastoma. And uh, we were waiting in the exam room, I should say, waiting in the waiting room for uh, the whole day. Well, eight hours, a very long, very long procedure. The surgeon indicated he wasn't really sure if he was going to be able to excise the whole. Uh, also wasn't sure about what other vital areas were going to be affected in the brain. So after uh, eight hours, a uh, surgeon walks into the room, and imagine you know, you're there, you're sitting on the floor, you're tired, you're hungry, you're anxious. Walks in and says, I just did the most amazing dissection. I'm like, okay, what about you? Uh, and, um, you know, the, since that time, it's pretty nice to see the population level it's fairly, fairly impressive if you look at it uh, in these absolute terms. It's more impressive if you look at it in relative terms. So now we're switching from absolute to analysis like a 25% decline. Uh, it's hard to argue we're making tremendous progress. However, if you look at it, look at it in a different way over the historical trends, it's not that much progress. And it's even more impressive, I mean, I should say, even less impressive. You might wonder why I have such a high y-axis here. If you compare progress against cancer with progress uh, against heart disease. And it's also really important to consider uh, cancer costs. At the same time, we're thinking about progress against cancer, that the costs are, are skyrocketing. And these estimates are actually outdated. Uh, this, uh, from the NCI, estimated over $160 billion per year in the U.S. we will be spending on uh, screening and treatment of cancer, but it's actually probably higher than that. And this, appropriately, uh, has us worried. Uh, this is reaching the, the, the lay, lay media, uh, and there are a number of uh, concerns, both at the population level and also at the patient level. There's a lot of concern about financial toxicity. 
a known uh, side effect and something that we're required to be, or should be required to counsel our, our patients about. But at the same time, we're thinking about the rise in costs. As Warren Buffett would say, uh, you have to look at the content. Price is what you pay, the value is what you get. So the question is, are we getting value for this increased, increased investment in cancer? One way of looking at that question is to look at international comparisons. So here, I've plotted the trajectory of cancer mortality in the U.S. versus the U.K. And the U.K. used to be higher than us, but now we're, we're, we're roughly the same. It's been, again, nice, nice progress on both fronts. However, if you look at the expenditures, uh, the U U.S. is spending uh, more than twice as much, this is in but more, more than twice as much uh, per cancer patient for, for management uh, as they are in the U.K. with the same outcomes at the population level. So we really need to think about this. Uh, what value are we getting for cancer care? So one thing about cancer in the U.S. is we have this cancer exception. This is a disease that appropriately uh, scares people, uh, captures our, our, our imagination in both positive and negative ways. Uh, and also, it's probably the most heavily advertised, marketed, uh, uh, talked about condition. And, and uh, this concept of uh, using cancer the way you draw people into your medical center and, and uh, thinking of how to target people's hopes, but also, unfortunately, I think we're sometimes preying on people's fears when we're, when we're thinking about uh, uh, telling stories about cancer and, and, and advocating for, for cancer therapies. And specifically, I want to talk a little bit more about that, about therapies. Here, you can't, you can't even drive down I-95 without seeing these billboards or on, on a subway for, for new cancer treatments. So this is looking at whether it's the robot or treatments or, or, or what have you. It's the technology that really excites people. It really draws people in. And that's what gets me interested as a researcher, because I want to know what, you know, what whether these new cancer technologies, uh, these new treatments are really effective at the population level. That's what I want to talk to you about today, because my concern is that we are a society that loves new and better and more expensive in general. But uh, when it comes to cancer therapies, we may not be doing uh, a service to our patients if we're rapidly adopting new, new therapies without carefully paying attention to, to how they work and whether they're helping people. So to summarize uh, three parts of today's talk, first I wanted to discuss some specific cancer care innovations, uh, thinking about how do they, uh, how do they spread social contagion, which is one mechanism of prevention of it, how, uh, how these new technologies spread. And a little bit of it, I'm talking about uh, a new paradigm for how we might think about uh, evaluation of new technologies. So thinking of these innovations, the, um, the ones I'll focus on will uh, begin, well, actually, well, uh, so breast cancer screening has been uh, a number of Developments over the past 10 years in mammography. Uh, so we started off with plain field mammography, and every, every five or 10 years we're, we're dialing up the uh, technological skills and, and, and uh, computational ability uh, of, the map, of the mammographer, of the mammography uh, machine, and we're really changing the way we're screening for breast cancer. Uh, radiation therapy, uh, a number of uh, new modalities, uh, for all new vaccinations for the uh, preoperative. specific mutations within tumors. But so let's build on this precision oncology idea. Um, one of the things I'm interested in, in is how and really how quickly new treatments disseminate into practice. In the world of science, you really think about the period of moment. Right? You know, there's a the 
discovery, running down, people are running down the street to tell other colleagues about it, and there's immediate change in, in, in the field of science. But in medicine, it's a different story. In medicine, the classic um, teaching with regard to how clinical trials are changing practice is that it takes 17 years. Maybe I'm so old. I, do you remember learning this? I was always taught it takes 17 years for uh, clinical evidence to have an impact on guidelines in clinical care. And we're always told, oh, God, all the rest of the guidelines, people don't change their practice. And because this is really a clinically relevant thing because of, of policies such as the FDA accelerating the approval program. So we're thinking about a new medication. Uh, one of the challenges the FDA has is that if, if a drug looks like it may be really helpful, uh, specifically in new cancer treatment, looks like it's really promising in a, in a moderately early phase or mid phase study. The question is, at what point do you release it into the wild? Because right? if you do this too slowly, people are, are, are literally dying. You're giving it back to the patients who ignore it. And if you do it too quickly, on the other hand, people might start using it, right? and then it might you know, be to your benefit. So this is kind of like a compromise here. The FDA accelerated the approval program uh, as far as drugs that are, I should say, for life-threatening uh, drugs that treat life-threatening conditions. Uh, they're allowed to surrogate outcomes that are reasonably likely to correlate with health and health outcomes, like progression free survival or things like that, like looking at heart outcomes and overall survival. And post approval studies are required. It's a nice this is a, it's a nice idea. So the idea is you have a preliminary uh, evidence that it might work against a surrogate outcome, but we'll let you guys use it in a clinical practice, but you must do the follow up study. Let's make sure it really works. The problem is FDA, five years in prior studies have shown that five years after FDA approval, uh, the evidence that's convincing is often still lacking. So, for instance, one review of uh, the EMA, the European Corollary uh, of the, uh, the FDA, they looked at uh, 68 cancer drugs that were approved by the similar pathway, and uh, after five years, half of them had no supporting evidence that they had better survival. Similar study um, of FDA approval. They looked at 36 uh, drugs that are approved initially on the basis of a surrogate endpoint. And then uh, five years later, under the accelerated pathway, the majority of them had either uh, no survival benefit or survival benefit was unknown. So, challenges that you're being uh, approved on this accelerated pathway with the promise of subsequent demonstration of clinically relevant uh, endpoints so of real benefit. But we're not necessarily uh, getting that subsequent data. So we wanted to really look at the key question here is how quickly are these drugs being disseminated into practice? And second, is uh, drugs uh, beneficial? So I'm going to focus on the first part of that question this morning. Uh, because if, if the drugs are very slowly disseminating into practice, then that might make you feel in some ways reassured because doctors are using them very carefully. They're paying attention to who was in the clinical trials with regard to age. You know, there's this whole concern that the age of people in trials tends to be much younger than the age of the general population. So if there's slow adoption, on the one hand, uh, it means it gives us a chance to develop more evidence and really study uh, the effectiveness. It's really rapid adoption, um, it, it might be good for patients, right? Because the whole point of the accelerated pathway is to give people access to these types of potentially life-saving drugs. Uh, but if it's very rapid adoption, it might also uh, uh, be exposing people to unknown, unknown risks. So to answer this question, we uh, uh, formed a partnership with this data science company called Flatiron. Uh, give a whole talk about this, this, these guys and this relationship, but it's an interesting group. Anyway, so they um, developed uh, <clears throat> a large database uh, by harvesting data from EMRs across the country, uh, almost all from private practices. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we used the flat iron data to study the adoption of a couple of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and specifically nivolumab and pendolizumab. So, I just uh, take a uh, pause for a minute. I wanted to highlight some of the actual studies that were uh, the pivotal trial. 
celebrated. So for melanoma, that was the first uh, first one. Uh, and we, we will hear the primary endpoint was response rate, and uh, there's a higher response rate in the, uh, the drug group than in the comparison group. In Embro, again, conservative endpoint outcome, again, 26 percent. It's a single arm study. There's no comparison. Non-small lung, non-small cell lung cancer. Again, uh, this is a surrogate outcome. Here, the hard outcome is comparison. Certainly, no comparison. So, there's a real variability in the strength of the data supporting these drugs before they were released into the market. So, two things we wanted to look at is one might hypothesize that the strength, the variation in the strength of the data might lead to variations <coughs> in the doctor. Other thing we wanted to look at was the difference in the age. Child participants in the age of the above the locations of the condition. And is there a differential rate of adoption? Because perhaps, uh, being aspirational, perhaps uh, uh, physicians who are taking care of older patients, who are, if they're not included in the studies, may be a little bit slower to adopt uh, in the older group than they are in the younger group. I'm going to skip over this. It's um, Flatiron. Uh, they do a, uh, a careful, it's like a, a technology, technologically enabled manual chart review. So just trust me, it, 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 it's pretty accurate. It's, <laughs> it's been much better than the usual administrative data that I'm, I'm to, uh, attached to. Uh, so for non small cell lung cancer, this was the uh, data. Nevo is approved here. This is the first month after Nevo is approved. This is the percent of patients, uh, who are eligible patients, who receive Nevo. Uh, so we started tracking Embro that they they able to do. So check this out. In the first month after approval, forty percent of eligible patients receive Nevo. Within four months, sixty percent of patients with lung cancer who are eligible. This is a large. This is a large sample. Uh, received um, received a, a, one of the PD1 inhibitors. Similarly, for melanoma here, uh, again, this is the first one that was approved for anything. But after uh, the month after approval, uh, it, was, it was already 70% of patients with metastatic melanoma were getting it. Uh, and sure, there was a, a, a Nevo became more popular. But the point is, if you look at the two in aggregate, the standard of care changed virtually overnight. When we compared, uh, we thought the same thing for renal cell. Uh, when we uh, compared the age of patients uh, in the trial versus the actual practice, this just confirms prior studies that basically the people in the, uh, the trials were much less likely to be older than the patients in clinical practice. So our question then, as I mentioned before, was was there a differential rate of adoption? So here's just one example. So check this out for melanoma. Basically. Uh, each of these drugs has a, a three different lines. So this is, um, this is Pembra. Uh, younger, youngest patients, middle, older. Uh, and basically, although there's a little bit of noise, there's no real difference in the rate of adoption by uh, these drugs. So this suggests that clinicians are not really paying attention to the, the age, age differential between trial patients and their patients that are sitting in front of them in the clinic. So let's move on now to radiation. So uh, for adjuvant radi uh, radiotherapy, um, uh, the traditional approach is uh, external beam. And you can get like long course or short course. And give a whole lecture on this. But uh, also there's a new, uh, new-ish technology uh, called uh, brachytherapy. We've, we've long been familiar with that for prostate cancer. The idea behind breast brachy, oh, wait, oh, sorry. Put a hold on that. First, let's do breast cancer screening. Uh, I was looking at my finger on that. Okay, um, <laughs> for the breast cancer screening modalities, uh, two of the new uh, uh, innovations that we wanted to uh, assess the use uh, was uh, computer aided detection and uh, digital mammography. Uh, digital mammography is a particularly interesting thing because uh, that 
actually some randomized trial data suggesting that a digital mammography is no better than uh, regular pill mammography for older patients. It was a deep study, a deep trial, and in a randomized trial of digital film in the older patients over the age of 65, subgroup analysis, uh, they actually found that some trends were uh, inferior performance. However, Congress mandated that Medicare cover these two through two new technologies in the early 2000s um, in response to uh, pressure from, from advocates. So we looked at the use of these new modalities in the Medicare population, and as one would expect, after Congress mandates something, there's a huge increase in the uh, proportion of mammograms that are done digital and uh, similar. So what we wanted to, again, so here it's unusual, unusual to literally have an act of Congress, but uh, the idea is these new technologies, they, they rapidly disseminate into practice. So one question we had is, does this uh, affect patient outcome? So what, what's the cl clinical impact of this? Uh, because we know it increases costs, right? So these new technologies, they, they, they add for each mammogram, there's an incremental cost effect, uh, impact. And, it, um, on the basis of this one uh, act of Congress, the cost of Medicare went up by almost 50%. So there's a few ways to look at the differential impact. One of the things we want, one of the ways of doing this is uh, to look at the uh, hospital referral, the regional level expenditures on breast cancer screening. And uh, here you can see this, this one is cost, uh, cost of beneficiary. Uh, there's a large variation Other analysis show that the main reason for the cost differential is the use of uh, CMG and digital networks. The new technologies that drive the, drive the cost differential. So the next question is, well, if you have some regions that are spending new fancy technology, are they achieving better, better outcomes? So uh, what we looked at was the, uh, the most, the richest, Investing more in the new technologies, uh, at least if you compare different regions or trajectories across time, doesn't seem to be having an impact. Okay, part two of uh, uh, new screening modalities. Uh, now there's 3D mammo. Speaking of ads, this is probably the most heavily advertised thing um, uh, I've seen recently. Um, and uh, you can see on the right, well, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, there are, um, the whole point is it, it is like a, a Uh, 3D MAMO does look quite promising. Again, I don't want to come across as the cynic that hates all new technology. I think this might be a good thing. Uh, so it improves, it improves the recall rate, it lowers the recall rate, it improves cancer detection. We're finding more cancers. Um, there is an incremental cost. It's about an extra 50 bucks a pop. Private insurance, maybe a little bit more. Um, and uh, generally, it's like a roughly a one third increase. Uh, but my concern is, so we keep dialing it up. We keep saying, oh, it's just an extra 50 bucks a pop, an extra 50 bucks a pop. But in the big picture, we're not totally sure, especially for women in their 40s, how effective mammography is. And every time you keep increasing the cost of it by a third, you should really be looking carefully at um, population level impact. Um, we're still early in this study, uh, but um, the guidelines were, were motivated by the fact that uh, 
uh, there's already a, a variation across um, some of these uh, organized bodies that are putting some guidelines. So the um, US ESPF has had a beta American Society that has had that for beta. Um, uh, of course, there are probably skeletons. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, so again, we don't have a, a, a lot of outcomes data, but I'll show you what we've looked at. Uh, led by Alana Richmond, one of our um, a young faculty members who's terrific. Uh, she's characterizing the uptake of um, uh, DBT uh, in a large privately insured sample. We're uh, just starting to look at the <coughs> impact on recall rate and cancer detection rate. Um, so uh, this is with, uh, among women who are 40 to 50 miles, So this is also disseminated really rapidly into clinical practice. So let me show you some, oh, and also, I love maps. I just look at maps all day long. So, and as you would expect, there's a, a tremendous amount of variation across regions uh, in the rate of, of adoption. And we think it's really just driven by the um, uh, people purchasing the, the, the machines and the uh, software. Um, so. As far as, uh, okay, so there's two groups here. This, again, this is very, 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 very primary and unadjusted analysis. So, among women who had a traditional hormone, when we compare those to what happened after women had a baby mammal. And then, uh, so the diagnostic mammal, uh, again, because the whole point is maybe we're decreasing the recall rate, we're less likely to have something worrisome. So, so less likely to have a diagnostic. Dramatic, like <laughs> <laughs> it's so different. It's hard. It's otherworldly. <laughs> um, but um, actually, our our, radi our um, radiologist colleague, her concern was when people first start using this new technology in actual practice, uh, it's a learning curve. And, and, and she actually predicted this. She said, when staffs first start using from a biographer, first start using from the Amano, they're not going to be familiar with it, and it's not going to really be beneficial. To this is kind of interesting. It's just really uh, interesting for the reading writer. But it's also interesting. The, um, again, this is like using Medicare claims, like in the health office, like who had an extensive you know, custom credit curve. It's like really crude and rough. Uh, but it does look like there um, may be a little more cancer detection associated with the which might be a good thing. Maybe not. That's a different conversation. But uh, here, the new technology rapidly disseminated into practice and potentially uh, have differential test characteristic. How did you uh, estimate the recall? Just with the claim. So basically, like, did you have such recall rate as defined by the Indian courts within, within a certain period of time, did you have an additional diagnostic manual or ultrasound that that was being presented? So it was the recall rate that actually led to, led to something else happening to you. Oops. Okay. Remember everything I told you about brachytherapy? Okay. <laughs> Refresh yourself. All right. So the whole point of breast brachytherapy is you are, um, uh, as opposed to external gene, you're actually infusing the radioactive element into the uh, tumor bed. On the one side, it's so logical. It's like that's where the tumor was. So you put the radiation there, which blasts that whole little area, you, you, you eliminate that. Um, the nice thing about this is it leads to a much shorter So 
Ben Smith and Tom Kenny Anderson against the Bernie Knights study, which seems to suggest that they're actually pretty impaired to associate with worse breast cancer in the young couples because of the highly recurrent cell level replacement that's going to the Other negative thing about the breast radiotherapy is look, it's a higher, potentially a higher risk for local complications. You have several genes, and you're not putting things inside the breast cavity and making the radioactive elements in there. So we wanted to look at, again, <laughs> I feel like there's a theme coming in. We wanted to look at uh, the rate of adoption of brachytherapy and impact on clinical outcomes. So um, uh, using Medicare data, uh, there was a rapid increase uh, of all women um, uh, who were getting uh, adjuvant breast uh, increase uh, from, uh, from nil to uh, about 12% of women who were getting brachy during our study period. <laughs> And we found a much higher rate, again, this is using Medicare claims, but a much higher rate of complications in the brachytherapy groups, uh, and this is specifically uh, for the wound and skin complications. And if you put this together with the concerns about potentially uh, inferior breast cancer specific outcomes, so it's kind of like, well, the bad news is you have worse cancer outcomes, and the bad news is you have more complications. <laughs> so it makes you wonder what you know about the, um, the speed of adoption and what, what's pushing it. Uh, and finally, one other thing just to uh, discuss is the preoperative MRI. So before women with breast cancer get surgery, there's a thought that if you uh, obtain an MRI, it can help with surgical planning. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, MRI is a much, much, much clearer picture. So what we wanted to look at was, um, <laughs> say it with me, rate of adoption? <laughs> no, oh, rate of adoption. Here you can see, again, uh, this is for women uh, in using Medicare data uh, with breast cancer, um, uh, now more than 25% are, are getting uh, MRIs before the, before the surgery. And if you look at the youngest group within Medicare, uh, it refers up to like 40% of women are getting preoperative MRI. So again, very rapid, but is it helping, is it helping patients? So one thing we know for sure is it's associated, getting a preoperative MRI is associated surgical practice. So here, uh, what we found is that among women who had an MRI, 12% of women had an MRI. There's no MRI in the group. So the odds, adjusted odds of ratio is about 2.2. So if you have an MRI, this is an association, not necessarily a causal association. But if you have an MRI, you're much more likely to have a bilateral prophylactic. Which makes sense. What do MRIs do? They're not only good at finding uh, uh, this uh, really clearly delineating the known cancer, but you're also potentially finding uh, the little doodads in other breasts, which may or may not be cancer, but they're producing worms in people um, that are, are, are often for the bilateral mastectomy. So we think this is one, uh, this technology could be fueling this movement toward uh, bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. Another way to think about these outcomes is, again, this is an imperfect study. Uh, so the, um, one way to think about this is also, is MRI uh, helping to find cancers, traditional cancers that are removed from or are just holding back cancers? So the impact is the same So this is the, can we look at the incidence of contralateral breast cancer? And again, the whole point is that breast cancer you're finding contralateral cancers that are clinically painful, <coughs> that would be a good thing to know about. Okay. So here, there's two groups. This is the MRI group. So among uh, and this, this is not an MRI group, but that actually happened. So in the MRI group, we looked at who had a contralateral breast cancer uh, diagnosed. Here. So as you can see, these are the months, uh, uh, months since the original uh, MRI was first used. So roughly six percent of followed all the people at the time as we look at the cumulative incidence. So this is after five years, uh, this is how many whatever it is, five percent of women uh, who had an MRI and contralateral cancer diagnosis. So if you would expect the MRI group, these women with MRI here, okay, so that's why this is good to talk about. These women don't have an MRI here. So this is how many women who had an MRI as you would expect, much less likely. But 
if these contralateral cancers were really uh, meaningful and causing problems, you would expect eventually they'd all be diagnosed, right? So this, if there was not over diagnosis in this group, in the non MRI group, you would say, well, I should not find these, these invasive cancers. This is a big problem. And these women are using them for preventing treatment of tiny those products, and eventually they're going to come in with cancers. To see what I'm uh, but uh, we found that's not the case. So after five years, uh, the, the curves are not lining up, which suggests that a lot of these additional cancers that we're finding in the MRI may not have been clinically normalized. Now, the flaw in the study is we don't know the actual experimentation. There could be differences between the people who got the MRI. We adjusted for all of the tumor -like characteristics that were available to the sphere. So, Adopting MRI rapidly is associated with more bilateral, more aggressive surgeries, and uh, we may even be overdiagnosing contralateral cancers. Uh, finally, let's turn back to precision medicine. Uh, here, uh, one of the most exciting things over the past 20 years in science in general is our ability to plan to sequence DNA at a very, at a very low cost. This is a cost per the whole point is that the cost of sequencing the genome has fallen so low that, as you know, you can have these ones. I mean, it's kind of amazing. You think that this is a for Christmas present. So it's, you know, this is like a billion dollar endeavor that you uh, <laughs> sequence one person's uh, DNA. But also, we're doing this now for um, for individual tumors when someone's diagnosed uh, with, with a cancer. Um, and uh, one of the things we wanted to look at was this multi gene panel sequencing. It does it. Uh, by Carolyn Presley, who's a, a wonderful actually I think oncologist, um, uh, we evaluated the differences in survival between patients who received uh, these next generation sequencing and those who don't. The concern here is that uh, there, there's a recommendation that it will, we, we get next generation sequencing or, or one of these multi panel tests. Um, however, the test of the, the most common uh, Uh, they tested about 300 genes. Uh, they charge about $4,500 for this test. But the challenge is most of these genes that they're testing for are not necessarily linked with a specific actionable mutation. So um, there's, there are a few mutations that do have a pretty drug that they have to with them. But a lot of these mutations, if you look at these reports, they'll, they'll say, like, here's 27 mutations you have. And I'm like, that's all the time because <laughs> there's no drug for it. Uh, but the, um, uh, so our question was, uh, um, patients with lung cancer who get these tests, uh, how often are they being uh, linked to uh, a specific therapy that, that helps them? And in the bigger, broader picture, uh, if you can care for these patients who get the NDS therapy, for those who don't, is it improved survival? Um, so here, we, again, we use the flat iron data. The nice thing is that they um, actually had uh, the, the full neck next generation sequencing results. So we were able to have cancer info as well as the results of those tests and then compared, compared to groups. Um, so uh, just cut to the chase. Uh, if an unadjusted sequence like the table, there are a lot of complications out there that say, oh, look, you know, we, uh, we improve survival uh, the, the, the multi-gene panel test and uh, improve the selective So what we did is First of all, there are a couple of mutations that, um, outside the next generation sequencing, there are a couple of mutations that the, the GFR mutation is available to talk to the mutation. They have never been to test before. It's a widespread agreement that we have one that we have to be able to do a lot of So therefore, it doesn't, it's not really fair to give you credit if you have, uh, if you get a new multi-gene panel sequencing, if, if those mutations are found, because that's like, so what we did is we made a comparison group. We had to also at least get these recommended tests of the ones that we have no uh, agreements or uh, specifically linked to the financial models. And 
So let's transition now, because uh, I think I um, hopefully have convinced you all that uh, these new uh, treatments, the diagnostic tests, are disseminating very rapidly into clinical practice, and the impact on outcomes is, is uncertain at best. One of the things we wanted to look at when it comes to the mechanism for this dissemination um, into clinical practice is this idea of social, uh, social contagion. So as social creatures, uh, the interpersonal context in which an individual is embedded influences uh, his or her in interactions uh, um, with everything from pathogens to ideas. Uh, social contagion considers the extent to which one's peers influence one's own behavior. Anyone who's gone through junior high school knows this. Uh, this has been shown across a wide variety of uh, behaviors and traits, uh, including obesity, smoking, and happiness. Uh, here's a nice... Um, image from uh, one of Nicholas Christakis's initial papers. Let's see if I can get this to... Oops. Um, i went up too quickly. So, but basically the idea is this is obesity in a social network, and uh, what it showed uh, over time was that uh, patients who would meet with an uh, obese friend were more much more likely to be participating in the problem of this activity. It showed the same thing with, uh, uh, with these other outcomes, such as obesity and mood. But the idea is, uh, can we take these insights with regard to how humans are affecting each other and think about, um, does this actually apply to changes in, in, in medical practice? So when we're thinking about peer interactions, two ways to think about it is, first of all, simply dyads. So we have explored each of these two ways of thinking about um, of peer influence. Uh, first is brachytherapy. So we wanted to look at um, the surgeons, because the, they're the ones who put the, de put the devices in, um, whether peer, ex peer exposure uh, in a dyad was related to subsequent adoption of brachytherapy. So again, just to remind you, um, this was our initial figure showing how brachy is adopted. So we looked at Uh, just remember that's T1 and T2. Okay. So in time period one, we found surgeons who were not using brain. None of their, none of their patients got brain. Then we looked in T1 at their uh, other surgeons with whom they shared patients. If any of your buddies shared patients with brain, why is using brain? Because then you have had the exposure to an early brain. Then we looked at whether And the answer is yes. So a predicted probability uh, is uh, substantially more likely to uh, adopt. Again, these are people who were not using brain in T1. It's substantially more likely to use this new technology in T2 that they had shared patients with someone who used it in T1. Now let's move on to this other uh, type of network or relationship um, uh, that I described. So there. I, just lo I love these peer groups even more than I love math. So the idea is these are all different um, uh, ways of conceptualizing 
uh, I should say, I should say, of demonstrating uh, uh, these peer networks. Uh, the different specialties are, are different colors, but the idea is that you take a geographic region and then you uh, can identify how a position is best to possibly be the best to be as three groups, three, three peer groups. And then we look at what's happening within the peer groups as individual entities. So the idea for this study. Um, we wanted to look at this other uh, technology, which we discussed, was uh, the use of uh, preoperative MRI. And we looked at whether, if you were a surgeon, uh, whether the behavior of other docs in your peer group associated with, was associated with your use of MRI. Same idea, T1. That's, what, that, that's how we looked at your exposure among the non-users to see what happened in T2. Um, and we found a really nice dose response. So basically, the, uh, if you look at the, the MRI use of your peer group in the first half of the year, the higher it is, it's uh, much more likely to suffer uh, about the MRI. And finally, we looked at uh, this idea of degrees of separation. Um, and the idea here is look, Building on those uh, uh, those networks that we had uh, composed, um, uh, you can think of uh, traveling between two docks uh, across these lines of connection to see how close or far, or far you are away from someone else in a network. So surgeons can be linked uh, through these shared patients. If you're linked directly, you're a first degree connection, like that. Uh, if you're two apart, uh, that's a second degree connection. So uh, this is an actual uh, network that we used in our analysis. Uh, we, we made all of the, uh, uh, yeah, so the yellow means you, you are a surgeon if you used uh, MRI, uh, and the purple, purple plug did not use MRI. And it's hard to see which should, but there is some clustering here. So the, generally the yellow ones, uh, a little bit clustered together, uh, was uh, suggesting that maybe there's there's a better way to think about this. So how can we really explore this idea of, um, uh, of looking at uh, degrees of separation? So what we did is we looked at schematic. So this is an actual, um, for each peer physician network, we looked at um, the likelihood that two docs uh, for a certain degree of separation were uh, important. So the idea is uh, we want to look at the ratio, the likelihood, um, if, uh, if we're one degree separated, the likelihood that we shared in our MRI use status, as opposed to if we were in a group and the MRI were randomly assigned, we uh, would be the kind of ratio a thousand times for each group, so it's pretty dramatic. So to come up with this estimate of the likelihood um, for each degree of separation that two surgeons would share the same uh, practice with regard to MRI use. Let's go over this. Basically, what we found was that um, uh, this peer influence uh, was seen without the three degrees of separation. So, the first degree of separation, um, if uh, two dots uh, were, were separated by one degree, was 30% more likely to, uh, to, uh, to share. If I was a non if you're an MRI user, I'm 30 percent more likely to be an MRI user because I'm one degree separated. Similarly, second degree uh, also is about 15 or 17 years more likely to be a third degree if you spot uh, a small or significant relationship. So again, the idea is if we're trying to carve out, um, carve away other explanations for this concept of social contagion. So we, we looked at uh, temporal trajectory. Here we're looking in a cross-sectional way at the distance within the network. But the bottom line is uh, the evidence is suggesting that uh, the docs are influencing each other with regard to adoption of new technology. And our hope is in the future, can we think of how to use that for good? Right? How to use peer influence for good? I, back to the junior high school, we have similar discussions with our teenagers at home about uh, the good and bad, but uh, potentially the power of peer influence. How much of that is influenced by um, 
the clinical environment. So mm -hmm. uh, health system versus independent practices. Were you able to take because you know there's there's culture. You know, I'm sure yeah. a place like Sloan Kettering um, is you know more rapidly adopting some of these new technologies and diffusing that internally than perhaps more rapidly than say diffusion that might happen across independent practices even within the same city. So were you able to look at that? Well, so questions might those end up. Those docs and the huge institutions might end up in a different network from the way the networks are constructed. We did try an alternate approach to creating a network, which is just hospital based. For each doc, we said which is the hospital the preponderance of your patients are admitted to. And then that was it. That was the hospital based network. And we found that this, this patient sharing networks are more consistent over time and had a stronger relation to the, uh, uh, to, to the adoption uh, than hospital based networks do. But, but yeah, it's something that. Um, I think it's an important consideration because the, um, that physicians who work really closely within the same practice might not necessarily share patients. If they're just two surgeons right next to each other, they might talk all day long, but after they each are seeing their own patients. Yeah. So yeah, that's something. I think they're both important. Um, and then, okay, I don't want to leave time for questions, but basically the whole point here is to think about uh, can we come up with a, a new paradigm for the way are investigating uh, and disseminating uh, new treatments. So as we are thinking about or using new technologies into the wild, we should really just consider what are, what are our goals I mean, are we really having an impact on our population. Um, sure. As a society, we consider uh, what are our humility when it comes to uh, whether our new uh, discoveries are, are really the next big thing. Because we've been saying we have the next big thing for a hundred years. And that's human nature. And it's absolutely integral that we are optimistic and excited about our, our new technologies. But uh, if we're not careful, we can end up uh, being more vulnerable. Uh, I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned Lisa, my sister in law, at the beginning of this talk, um, how she was diagnosed with a glioblastoma in 1999. Um, the amazing thing is she's still here today, 20 years later. She's still alive. Uh, but none of us <laughs> thought that was, none of us thought that would happen. Um, and uh, she wrote a book about her experience. And uh, it just shows that we don't always, we're not able to predict what the future will hold. And we don't know why we lose us in that small, tiny tail of a grain. But we can pray if we can get more people there, but do so in a way that's uh, safe. stronger real world evidence that we can actually truly move towards a running a running healthcare system. So that when patients are coming into the uh, clinic and, and they say, you know, as great this new drug Pembro is and that works, but what about me? What about someone who is eight years old with heart failure um, and uh, stage two kidney disease is going to help me? And they should be able to say, well yeah actually here's what happens Any questions? <laughs>